Friends, neighbors, countrymen, lend me your ear. This is episode 291 of the Juice Box Podcast. A supersized Ask Scott and Jenny with how many ads? Zero. That's right, baby. We reached the end of the year. So instead of ads, at the end of the podcast, a little Christmas cheer. Here's what we're going to do today in Ask Scott and Jenny. We are going to talk about, hmm, I'm looking. Wow, you would think I could read my own writing, especially notes that I've taken in the last hour. Well, this is a letdown. Okay. We're going to talk about microbolusing glucagon, like around the flu. So there's going to be a tiny bit of conversation around being sick, similar to what you just got in the episode about illness, but it's more about mini glucagon boluses. So we're going to deal with sick lows, like how to deal with sick time lows. We're going to talk about how Jenny speaks to people about addiction and um, eating disorders. We're going to talk about how you can discuss with young children what feeling low feels like. So maybe if they don't understand it, they can learn. And Jenny's going to describe her pizza bolus. Plus, just regular Scott and Jenny goodness. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, and to always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Okay, so here's a question from Trina that I don't know if there's an answer to, but I'm incredibly interested. Maybe you're just going to say there's no answer to this, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, she Now, Trina says she has a fairly newly diagnosed seven-year-old um, that can't recognize being low. Uh-huh. And then somebody else comes in and says, you know, I, you know, I have a daughter who doesn't feel low too. Um, Arden's always felt her lows at, you know, I can, I could tell by it, what she would say to me. I could, I could probably tell you what her blood sugar is by her response, you know, from 65 right. to 60 to 55 to under 50. I know, but is there a way to teach people to feel low? Like I, that doesn't. I don't feel like you could. And, and if not, then what are the reasons why some people feel it and some people don't? Or is there not even a reason for that? It's not uncommon for younger kids to not really be quite aware of what their body is signaling and telling them. I mean, outside of like like a big gash cut that they get in the backyard or something, you're like, oh my God bleeding, you know, or it hurts, you know, pain sensations are typically felt by all people, right? Um, But from the low sensations, kids are usually not very good with how their body is doing, Mm -hmm. you know, unless they're like, Oh, my God, I've got a toothache, or my ear really hurts, you know, and even little little kids like, you know, under the age of I would say, three, An earache is typically like they're rubbing their ear or they're like they don't want to lay down on that side. So as a parent, you can kind of tell as far as I mean, a seven year old technically should be coming into some body awareness, um, being able to sense some things. But as a as a parent, you might need to discuss some of what the common symptoms are. You know, maybe they don't know how they're supposed to be feeling if their blood sugar is low. Yeah. And maybe when it is low, saying, hey, you know, do you do you feel kind of shaky or do you feel sort of, you know, like you can't really um, you can't really do math. I mean, by the age of seven, kids are kids know how to add and subtract at least the basic numbers like, you know, 20 and less. Mm-hmm. Right. So in in that sense, maybe it's not a symptom, but maybe something you teach them is hey, do you know what two plus two is? Yeah. And most kids of the age of seven should be able to spit out four pretty quickly, right? If they can't, maybe that's something you teach them to think, okay, two plus two. I don't know what it is. And I mean, since we've got sensors, 
kids nowadays can actually visually see and they can start to associate a value with something in their body yep. that's not quite right. You know, asking them, does your tongue feel kind of funny? Do your lips feel kind of tingly? Um, you know, when you put your hand out, does it kind of shake a little bit? Or do you feel sort of like, you know, topsy-turvy on your feet? Sometimes it takes talking to kids about what they could be feeling to get them to start paying attention yeah, that makes sense. to symptoms. I, I think that I think that makes a ton of sense, actually, because you said something in there that just made me think we're expecting them to say, I'm dizzy, but they may have no, right. con they may have no context for dizzy. So maybe you take them at a time when they are absolutely at a good blood sugar and spit them in a circle a couple of times, and then go, Hey, if this ever happens, if this feeling ever happens, let me know. And, and we haven't spun you around like right. a twisty, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like if, if we haven't spun you and you feel like this, let me know. Or I think that's a great idea. Like, and I would caution, um, when you try to teach them these sensations, maybe don't tie them to diabetes because then it's possible they could make them up at some point too. Like teach, teach them the sensations, don't mention the diabetes and then just tell them, Hey, if you ever feel like this, we want to know. Right. Uh, you don't want to do the, um, I always used to say to my wife, like when, when we were first, you know, we first had Cole, if he fell over, she would like go at him and say, you know, like, are you okay? Are you hurt? You know, is your leg hurt? And I'm like, don't put thoughts in his head. You, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you, you hit your head. Are you hurt? Well, then you're like, oh, I guess I am. You, you know, like, so you can put that thought into someone's head. Um, but hey, that's a great, I did not think we were going to have an answer for that. This podcast is excellent. All right, let's go, <laughs> let's go to the next one. As the end of season five comes to a close, I want to take a couple of moments throughout this episode to thank you. There are 508 ratings for the podcast on iTunes today. And I took some time to jump around iTunes all over the world and in maybe six to eight other versions of iTunes, like Australia, Canada. There are amazing reviews for the podcast. I'm so touched by all of them. And I appreciate all the time and effort that it takes to put them up. They're really thoughtful and heartwarming. And I definitely think they go a long way towards helping other people find the podcast. So every time I say to you guys, please help someone else find the podcast, just know that I appreciate it and that you're doing it and it's working. You know, I saw somebody talking about something online the other day. Let me see if I can figure it out. I might have a question for you, Jenny. Hold on a second. Awesome. Um, well, I am going to hit this first, though, because then uh, how do you how do you help people who have type 1 and also have an addiction? So mm. um, let's – and let's keep it to a, a drug addiction. You know, sure. Is there – um, are there things that those people can be doing when they make the decision, like, I have to do better with my diabetes? Um, like how it, it seems like such a, a crazy thing, but at the same time, any kind of addiction could mess up diabetes. Obviously I think, you know, drugs and alcohol would probably be worse, but even if you had like a food addiction that would throw off managing your type one a lot, like how much do you end up having to talk about that with people? I would say that it's more the, um, and I'm glad that you brought in food as a piece of it. Um, while it's not, I mean, addiction isn't, there's a lot of disordered eating mm -hmm. um, that comes in with diabetes because our management is from the get-go very centered around food, intake food, and you do food, and you become, food becomes almost a control piece. Mm -hmm. For many people with diabetes, um, so I think it's good. It's right to kind of categorize it in with drugs and or even alcohol. Those are pieces that we end up um, talking to people about, but not really managing that piece for them. And so far as our explanation about things like, for example, alcohol, right, as an addiction. Um, alcohol can have major impact on blood sugar control right. and what happens within 
being drunk, right? Your ability to mentally decide things and make appropriate choices and what to do. And even, you know, if if you were high or drunk or whatever, and you were even changing your pump site, you could totally inaccurately do that. And you could have a a major problem, Right. right? So, I mean, those are pieces that we we do bring in as far as discussion. Um, we encourage people to continue with their, um, you know, their therapy if they are. And most of the people, I would say 98% of the people that we work with who have either had an addiction or are managing an addiction of some kind already have a therapist that they're working with. Yeah. Okay. I have not personally worked with anybody that has a known issue and hasn't had somebody that they're getting help with from it or for it. Um, But I think that's a big piece of it. It's also from the standpoint of their therapist or who they might be working with, that person also needs to understand the diabetes component to it because it needs to be brought in to the overall picture of discussion, you know. Because the diabetes is a stressor and that's going to be part of how they manage that. Correct. Yeah. I so I don't know if you saw recently I did a um something I called after dark drinking addiction addition mm. <laughs> excuse me and um it it was a piggyback off of a conversation you and I had when we talked about how to bolus for alcohol and then I said you know what Jenny I'm going to get like a professional drunk on here to talk about this right and actually the funny thing is is that uh the person Maya who ended up being on the episode two different people in her life who listen to the podcast separately of her contacted her and said, oh my God, it's your turn to be on the Juice Box podcast. (laughs) He's like, she's looking for somebody, uh, Scott's looking for somebody who knows how to really drink and take care of their diabetes. It's your turn. And she sent me a message and she's like, I don't know how to feel about this, but apparently I'm the professional drunk you're looking for. And I was like, gotcha. (laughs) So she came on and we had a really honest conversation about how she manages. She's a person who drinks. She's not a She's not a blackout drunk. Do you know what I mean? Right. But, but she drinks a lot more than probably most people do. Like, you know, she's at least having a couple of glasses of wine a day at her meal. And she's a person who finds a lot of pleasure going, as she described, going to like out to a lake and tubing around and drinking a case of beer and that kind of thing. And she talked about all how she did it. Super interesting. When I asked her what she thought the most dangerous part about drinking with diabetes was, she said... It was about making a bad decision with insulin when she was too drunk to yeah. do it correctly. And and she was like, that's my biggest fear. She's like, I figured out the rest of it. Like, I'm not super afraid of falling asleep and getting too low, especially because she has, you know, she's got good technology too. But, technology. Mm-hmm. But she said, I would think the biggest concern, and it's funny, it's exactly what you said. Like, what if I make like a grave mistake and give myself too much insulin? That's really, right. so that, there's a lot of consistency in that. Um as you're talking, I'd love to listen to that ac- episode actually, because that sounds um, it sounds very good, and I'm always I love to I love to learn, it's you know, more insight. even yeah, no, different I, I, insight exactly because it helps me to help people better. Well, the next one we're booking right now is uh, with a legit wake and baker. I found a 26 year old kid who smokes every day and has diabetes. I'm going to have him come on and talk about that. And as we're sitting here talking, I think I know somebody I'm going to reach out to about addiction and see if I can't do one with them too. Maybe they could add some more context than you and I are going to be able to. That would be great. Because even as you're talking about it, I realize that everything I thought to say was conjecture. I have no real life experience whatsoever. Like I can imagine what the problems might be, but I don't really understand what it's like to be addicted. So, um, So the answer to that one here uh, for Anna is that I think we're going to try to do an after dark episode about this and and get you more answers. Awesome. Cool. Um, We've done. Some of you are asking questions that are already. You're going to have to listen to more of the podcasts are already out there. Um, (laughs) Go search. They're on there. In fairness (laughs) to them, I don't really label them that well. I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year, a wonderful holiday season. I hope all of your dreams come true. I hope you find some time to relax. May you find time to be with your friends and family and just reboot. You know, let your brain go uh, limp for a couple of days.
so you can recharge. And I hope during all this eating and celebrating that's going to happen over the next couple of weeks, you keep in mind the things that we've talked about so far on the podcast, because I think they're going to help you. It's flu season, and uh, this person's asking about something I have absolutely no um, experience with. How do they microdose glucagon in scenarios where they have blood sugars that are so low that they can't they can't get them to come back up and the person's maybe too sick or can't keep down food? Like what are good, uh, I guess not just around glucagon, but what are good practices about addressing lows when you're sick? Oh, sorry. You cut out a little bit there. Addressing. Low, low blood sugars when you're sick, you know. When you're sick. Yeah. So, I mean, low blood sugars in illness are much more typical for stomach or digestive bugs. Mm -hmm. Um, Not as common for like the cold or, um, you know, like a bronchial infection. Those usually spike your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So lows aren't as common. Um, If the flu includes some digestive issues, then... We usually say a temporary basal decrease to begin with can help to cut the risk, especially if you're not eating very often or can't eat more than like chicken or vegetable broth, you know, or eat a popsicle every, you know, couple of hours or whatnot. So taking your basal down temporarily anywhere between 10 to maybe 25% less um, is a good place to start. If you have a blood sugar that you notice is starting to trend down and you literally, you're so nauseous that you can't take anything in, turning basal down by 80%. So you're really only running about 20% normal basal for about one to two hours really cuts off insulin significant enough Mm -hmm. that it should help that glucose to stabilize and not get too low in a time where you can't take anything in at all. Right. Um, so those are, you know, some some adjustments that can be done. Other ones, certainly, if you find something that you can sip on, even a little bit of like honey in the cheek or, um, you know, cake frosting, I know is another one that's commonly, you know, mm-hmm. mentioned maple syrup is very carby. So those kinds of things, even in a cheek and sort of massaging can help to get it to absorb through the, the like oral area without you having to maybe swallow it and it affect how your stomach feels. Okay. Correct. I mean, you're certainly not going to get a hundred percent of carb absorption, but you're definitely going to get some carb into the system by just putting it in the cheek and massaging it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's another good option. Um, electrolyte beverages, especially for stomach bugs are also a good place that you can get a little bit of carbohydrate. Um, there's one that's got a minimal amount of carb. It's called drip drop. Okay. Um, it's an electrolyte replacer. You put it in water. I think per serving, it's got like eight to 10 grams of carb. Mm -hmm. So again, not a lot, but enough that it could help to stabilize blood sugar some. Um, and then, you know, in a scenario where you really may need to use glucagon, if you don't have, if you don't have the current and newest Beximi, you know, the, the nasal sort of glucagon, that can't be mini dosed. Unless somebody figured out how to do that already. I don't know, but I mean, it's a one pop it in and it's there. You can't like micro dose it. Um, but there are some rules of thumb for micro dosing the injectable glucagon essentially you would mix up the glucagon the mixed glucagon is good for i believe up to 48 hours after mixing so if you had to use more of it over the time period of and stomach bugs usually don't last very long Mm -hmm. somewhere between 24 to 72 hours at the at the longest you would mix it up but you're not going to inject it with the glucagon injector syringe, you're essentially going to use an insulin syringe. Right. So for those people who are using insulin pens with needle caps, get a one-time prescription from your doctor for insulin syringes. Yep. Keep a box around so that you could go ahead and microdose your glucagon. Yeah. I, I would say Arden hasn't, uh, has been pumping for like ever, and we still have syringes in the house. I always make sure we have some. Just 
in case. Yeah. yeah. That's all. It just needs to be there just in case I need it. Um, so, so. And they don't really go bad. I mean, your syringes, I mean, they do have expiration dates on. And I, I always think it's funny. I'm like, is this, it's not like cheese. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a piece of plastic right? with a piece like, of metal on it. I haven't gotten it's a piece it of plastic. Or <laughs> I, I have some that are so I, – I had so many at the end of MDI that I gave a number of them away to somebody because I thought in a lifetime Arden won't use all these. You, you know, so right. we held on to a few. And they've lasted for a decade. It's, you know, but been incredibly helpful when they were needed. So when I – so when someone goes to micro bolus glucagon, is it just – is it a testing thing? Are you just trying it and seeing? Or you said there's a rule of thumb or – there is a rule of thumb, and I'm actually off the top of my head. I don't know. I'm actually looking in my um, education materials right now because it's something that I actually send to people um, <clears throat> for ability to stress. Well, while, you're, while you're looking at that, let me say this: the idea of sipping tiny, tiny little sips while you're sick of you know something that has a little bit of carbs in it with the electrolytes. First of all, it's going to help you being sick anyway. But it's really no different than when I was talking to someone uh, a month or so ago, somebody I know personally whose child has type 1 playing ice ho ice hockey and was getting low. And I said, look, I think he should have some sort of a Gatorade and water on the bench. And then when he sees himself dipping a little low, that's the time you take a couple sips of the Gatorade. And then the next time, if the arrow levels out, you go back to the water. And maybe you have to go back and forth a little bit to, to you know, kind of bump and nudge with the, the glucose from that drink, you know? Uh, right. And it worked out really well for them. I think you're basically saying the same thing. If you're sick and your blood sugar is just trying to get low all the time and cutting your basal back's not helping, then you just have to kind of – it doesn't have to be a big drink. Don't get into a situation where you need a big glass of liquid. Just – Right. Little bits, little bits, you know. Little sips. Yeah. And with nausea and everything, those little sips can sometimes still be tolerated mm -hmm. enough that you can, like you said, you can get in just a little bit incrementally. I mean, in <clears throat> stomach bug too, it also really helps to get in some carb that you are bolusing even a micro amount for mm -hmm. because it really helps to prevent starvation ketones. And anytime you're ill, you really want to prevent ketones of any kind because they could, even at lower blood sugars, I, I know we talked about this before as far as ketones, yeah. even with lower blood sugars in a time period of illness, it can lead to DKA, even at numbers that look more normal. So if along the line of a stomach bug, you're micro dosing for, you know, a, a popsicle that was 12 grams and you only bolus for three grams of it. It's getting enough little bit of insulin in mm -hmm. that you decrease significantly the risk of ketones. Yeah. You do not want to go into DK. And if you go into DK or you lose control of it, you got to get to the emergency room then. So correct. Yeah, don't correct. Especially going into like overnight, like, like don't, don't, you know what I mean? Like, at, it, it, make a decision. My wife wasn't feeling well the other day, and I was like, "Don't wait till Saturday to decide you need to go to the doctor." <laughs> right? So, yeah. Yeah, don't wait till midnight to decide. You know, I don't think I'm doing well, and then fall asleep and find out you are in DK overnight. Like, you know, you're gonna have to make. It sucks being sick. Uh, hopefully, everybody. Has and it here. kind of, you know, blood sugar wise, it kind of also in an illness goes along with where where should you look at the potential for needing something to help prevent a further dip, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're starting with somebody who's ill, really nauseous, unable to keep things in, or things are coming out kind of like both ends, yeah. not to be gross, but, you know, they really can't keep anything in, um, you may need to utilize something more than just taking basil down temporarily, right? That might not cut it completely. So then where should blood sugar safely be we usually say especially for kids not letting blood sugar get less than like 85 to 90 mm -hmm. um only because less than that you're really risking a quicker drop to being a time or a, a glucose value that you can't really recover from when somebody can't take anything in right so mini glucagon 
Um, and there are got a lot of really good resources online. Um, I mean, there's one at Diabetes in Control. There are some from the NIH. Um, typically for kids, um, we would recommend if your child can't take anything in literally at all. Um, and glucose looks like it's dropping. It's not like that nice stable, but it looks like it's trending down. Um, we'd recommend that the mini dose, mixing it up, that vial, push yeah. the liquid in, mix it up, get your insulin syringe. And using an insulin syringe, it's kind of based on age. So the mini dose of glucagon, each unit on an insulin syringe is 10 micrograms of glucagon. Mm-hmm. So that's the conversion. Okay. Um, if your child is under the age of two, you would need two units on the insulin syringe, which is 20 micrograms of glucagon. Okay. If your child is between the ages of three to 15, you would need one unit per year of age. So okay. one unit of an insulin syringe or 10 micrograms of glucagon per yeah. year of age. And then over the age of 16, it's 15 units or 150 micrograms. Okay. Um, and you'd inject it essentially the same way you're going to give insulin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, pinch up, inject it in. We typically still recommend, similar to low glucose, you know, we still recommend checking blood sugar every 15 minutes and definitely doing it with a finger stick. Don't just rely on your CGM value. Do a finger stick. Yeah. Get an accurate value. Um, and if it's still lower than that 90, or if you're someone listening from outside the States and you're in millimoles, that's five millimoles or less, um, then you can give your child a second injection of glucagon and you would actually double the dose from what you gave the first time. Hmm. Now, are they going to experience any of the kind of bad side effects that sometimes come from glucagon when you're mini dosing? Typically not. In fact, those symptoms, which common symptoms would be nausea and vomiting, um, which can be pretty significant if you gave that whole entire syringe full of glucagon, which to my understanding is at least what I initially learned was that syringe is meant to treat somebody up to 250 pounds. Wow. Jeez. So if you've got a little, you know, four-year-old who is like 30 pounds or 40 pounds, no wonder they're getting such a significant, like, nauseous with, yeah. yeah we, so the microdosing of it, you shouldn't. Arden's uh, emergency one at school, up until I think she was over, like, 80 pounds, just said, just give half of it. If you can, you know, just eyeball. Correct. eyeball I mean, if, if while a seven-year-old's having a seizure and you as a teacher who really never wanted to be a part of this can stop to think, I just want to put in half of this, well, you know, good luck and everything. Good luck, uh, right. Yeah, I think you're in an emergency situation then, and maybe the nausea afterwards is is the price of doing business, you know, but, um, I just wondered if it came with the microdosing too. Okay. So I had one more question. I don't know if we can get through it in 10 minutes, or sure. not, but, um, I wanna, we're good. are we? Okay. So yeah, we're going to do okay. one more, by the way, Arden's blood sugar, 77 and stable. Nice job. Thank you so much. Uh, banana bagel, three Milano cookies. Big, oh my gosh. Big bag of grapes. Have no, I have no idea how many, um, and a yogurt. I've even come to the idea of I can now put in more food to give her choice, knowing she won't eat it all and still hit the bu- the bolus right. It's, it's so I'm seriously. All right. So now we're going to test this, right? Uh, we are going to answer someone's question here. Gosh, why can't I just see it? I've been looking at it for 10 minutes while we're talking about glucagon and now all of a sudden I've lost track of it. But this person says, I don't know how to bolus for pizza. So given that everyone's going to be different still, I would like to ask you, you're a grown person. I'm assuming you eat pizza sometimes. How do you bolus for pizza? So assuming this person is using conventional insulin pump, Mm -hmm. um, and we don't know, I don't really state, hey, I'm on injections or I'm pumping or I'm, you know, right. using a Fresa nasal, nasal insulin or whatever you're doing, right? I, I don't know. So let's assume a conventional pump. Yep. In that case, the P 
pizza bolus sort of became the term for an extended bolus, Mm -hmm. right? It was the first reason that we started to use extended boluses or have that feature on a pump. And the reason being pizza is high carb, very, very high carb, unless you're somebody making a cauliflower pizza crust and whatever, your pizza is high carb from the grain nature. Right. But it's also really high in fat. I mean, unless you're doing a vegan pizza that has no cheese and sausage and whatever on top of it, your pizza is high fat. And if it's a pizza from an, a source outside, the crust probably has fat in it as well as the toppings that you're adding on top of it. So the high fat nature along with the high carb component to it really mean that if you bolused 100% right now for pizza, With a pre-bolus, as we've talked about before, the benefit of that, you're going to get low. And then your blood sugar is going to get high. And then it's probably going to stay high for a while, right? So there are a couple pieces to pizza food management. And let's kind of tie in nachos and, you know, fish and chips and like a cheeseburger and fries or a real Italian pasta meal with all the good cheese sausage and cheese and oil and whatever right so high fat essentially an extended bolus and again it takes a little experimentation to see what type of extension you need Mm -hmm. for the most part for pizza type of food you would use about a 60 or 70 percent upfront, possibly and the rest over at least a two-hour time period Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're giving insulin up front, but then that extension over about a two hour time period in the back end is grabbing on and hitting the food that's more slowly getting into the system because the fat isn't letting all 120 grams of that pizza get in right now. Right. Right. Um, Some people do a 50-50, 50% 50 now, 50% over two hours. That works very well. Um, I think the upfront amount, from my experience, really is specific to how much is on top of the pizza. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's your margarita pizza that has a couple of blobs of real mozzarella on top, but it's not slathered in cheese, and sausage and Canadian bacon or whatever, it's probably a lot lower fat pizza right. than something like the meat lovers. Yeah. Right. Right. So that breakdown of percent now, percent over time kind of goes along with the nature of what you've got on your pizza. Yeah. Um, but that's that's the gist of pizza. And again, it takes a little experimentation. Um, sometimes you gotta take a hit. Yeah. And learn right. and then move on from it, right? I would say, so Arden just had a slice of pizza going out the door to a party last weekend. And it was more the way you describe uh, in some ways. So it was a thinner crust, but it had less cheese. Like it's not completely covered with cheese, you know. And I, it, you know, I come to realize too, I live in a portion of the country where you know, I'm eating pizza that somebody in the middle of the country might have never seen before too. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not, it's not Domino's or, you know, some like Mm -hmm. restaurant chain pizza. This is, you know, this is a, it's a A real pizza, 90 year old Italian man who has a, you know, the, 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 the recipe for his pizza is chained in a box around it. You know, (laughs) have to kill him to get it from him. Uh, so, and I happen to live in that part of the country where pizza like that exists. And so, she has this thing, but it does have sausage on it. So I looked at it and I thought, okay, Arden's blood sugar is like 105, I believe, back then. Because she was she was a little on the lower side because she was spent a lot of time getting ready. It was a costume party and everything. She's moving around the house a lot. Blood sugar's nice and stable. I'm gonna have a slice of pizza. I didn't worry about pre bolusing it. And partly because I thought she might be trending down to begin with. So mm-hmm. it wasn't, but because it's pizza too. And my idea about these carby things that hit hard and then last is I kind of just think about it as getting my insulin up front to stop a rise or a spike. So I have so mm-hmm. much I have so much up front that there's no way for your blood sugar to spike. And then as time goes away, I can take 
insulin away and let what's left over from the big push at the beginning act as the basal going through at the end. That is one way I do that. Mm -hmm. The way you just described, I do as well. I don't need to re-describe it because you did such a a perfect job of talking about it. But uh, But another way is is that like, it's just, I bring in so many blockers up front. You can't sack my quarterback. And then later, right. later in the game, when you stop blitzing, I send them away, you, you know? So I, and so I sometimes get in so much up front that the, it can not only handle the food, but it can be part of the basal rate going away in the back end. And then, yep. I, and then I take the basal away. I trade, I trade bolus earlier for basal later to leave the bolus tail end acting as basal later. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, exactly. that is one of the ways I think about manipulating insulin. So, um, but and then the other component to pizza too is again, the fat content, right? Like I said before, the margarita pizza with a couple blobs of Buffalo mozzarella on top, probably not high enough in fat that you're going to have that long duration extended high blood sugar for mm-hmm. six, eight hours after. However, bring in the meat lovers and you not only probably need the extended bolus, Yep. But you probably need a temporary increase to your basal for hours after right. to avoid the sustained high. So again, scenario to scenario, you may have to decide what your strategy is going to be. But those are the typical ways to manage pizza. If Arden would have grabbed another slice, then I would no longer have been thinking about a bunch up front and no more in the right. back. Now I would have been as soon as she had the second slice, I probably would have bolused thin thin crust pizza. My guess is like 25 carbs. Like I probably would have, I probably would have bolus 25 carbs and probably done zero up front and the rest out over like an hour and a half. I would, right. as soon as she grabbed another one, I would have started thinking about the future. Yep. Uh, right. But it looked like one and then she was going somewhere. She actually did have to bolus once while she was at that party. We did not end up taking it away. I did a pretty good job of balancing it. And so while she was there, we had to nudge like a 134 diagonal up at one point. She did not eat anything at the party, though. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, at a certain age, kids just stand around and look at each other. So, right. <laughs> just, just like, so you're here. I'm here, too. And then they just, right. that's pretty much the end of it. Um, exactly. And I did not see Loop doing any gyrations during that time. Like, there, was, there was no temping mm-hmm. way away or way up, you know. Um, so I was in a fairly traditional situation there too because we'd hit the ball yep. so well in the beginning it just didn't loop didn't really have to do anything it just sat with her basal rate nice um, that is really kind of fun when you can see that when you're on an algorithm when you're like wow we did such a good job with the bowl is like the algorithm's not doing anything you're like yeah oh, wow that's really like that right you don't see the down or the up you know cityscape yeah. kind of thing you're just riding along you're like is loop is it working is it doing anything nope it's just got me hovering nice yeah, and like, flat. Oh, we really hit this one that's crazy all right okay so hopefully that was helpful My eternal grateful thanks to Jenny Smith from Integrated Diabetes. Don't forget, if you would like to hire Jenny, go to integrateddiabetes.com to contact her. Also in the show notes of your podcast app, Jenny's email address is right there. It also exists on juiceboxpodcast.com for this episode. And I know this was ad-free, but I'm feeling very festive. Omnipod, Dexcom, Dancing for Diabetes, Companion Medical Makers of the InPen, all the sponsors that supported the show this year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to try something that may or may not go well for the holiday season. We're about to find out. This is for all of you who listen with your children and for those of you who may still be children somewhere inside. The Grinch by Dr. Seuss. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's. Staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown, 
at the warm-lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a holly who wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas, it's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers, nervously drumming. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. For tomorrow I know all the Who girls and boys will wake bright and early. They'll rush for their toys. And then, oh, the noise. Oh, the noise, 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 noise. There's one thing I hate. All the noise, 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 noise. They'll stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'll stand hand in hand. And those who's will start singing. Fa-hoo-for-a-da-hoo-do-re, welcome Christmas, come this way. Fa-hoo-for-a-da-hoo-do-re, welcome Christmas, Christmas Day. Welcome, welcome, fa hoo Welcome, welcome, Dahu Damas. Christmas Day is in our grasp. So long as we have hands to clasp. Fahu Fore Dahu Dores. And they'll sing, and they'll sing, and they'll sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this Who Christmas Sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I've put up with it now. I must stop Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat. I'll make a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. This is stop number one, the Grinch Claus hissed as he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fist. Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santa could do it, then so could a Grinch. He got stuck only once for a minute or two. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue, where the little who stockings hung all in a row. These stockings, he grinched, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk, with a smile most unpleasant, around the whole room, and he took every present. It was quarter of dawn, all the who's still abed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, their ribbons, their wrappings, their snoof and their fuzzles, their tranglers and trappings. Ten thousand feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip-top to dump it. Poo-poo to the Who's, he was grinchly humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then those Who's down in Whoville will all cry, boo-hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. He paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But this sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded glad. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could this be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then the true meaning of Christmas came through, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches plus two. And now that his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light. 
With a smile to his soul, he descended Mount Crumpet, cheerily blowing hoo-hoo on his trumpet. He rode into Whoville. He brought back their toys. He brought back their floof to the Who girls and boys. He brought back their snoof and their tringlers and fuzzles. Brought back their patankas, their dafflers and wuzzles. He brought everything back, all the food for the feast. And he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. Welcome, Christmas. Bring your cheer. Cheer to all Who's far and near. Christmas Day is in our grasp, so long as we have hands to grasp. Christmas Day will always be just as long as we have we. Welcome, Christmas, while we stand, heart to heart and hand in hand.